Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Ian Blackburn. All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining me. My name is Ian Blackburn, and I'll be hosting the event tonight known as Stars of the Rhone Valley Wine. This is an awesome collection of top wines of the Rhone Valley in France and part of our continuing series of wine tastings where we deliver the wines to your home. Many of you uh, may be viewing offline, uh, but uh, we send little tasting kits with uh, little samples of each of the wines to your home and you're able to taste with us and the professionals right here and be involved. Now there's a couple of things. Uh, there's a chat box down at the bottom. We're gonna encourage everyone to take advantage of the chat add any comments or questions about the wines, especially if you uh, want to share maybe something you're smelling or tasting or feeling in the wine. And I really think that uh, you're going to love all the wines that we're tasting tonight. Everyone that's involved in the event gets a special discount code to be able to purchase these wines on the Merchant of Wine website during or after the, the Zoom event. Uh, this is a little different event. Um, some of our events are, are sponsored by the charity. Uh, this wine's completely of our own creation, and all the wines were purchased from the Merchant of Wine in order to perform this event tonight. Um, so we have uh, really worked together to get uh, some of the best in the business involved, and uh, really thank you. And I want to introduce you to a couple of people that are helping me tonight. Michael Larner is on the Zoom tonight. Uh, Mike, Mike Larner and I have been friends for a long time, and uh, Mike uh, worked, Michael worked in the Rhone Valley uh, for Gigal on his way to uh, getting a, involved in his own um, wine project in Santa Barbara. How are things with you, Michael? Oh, good. We're, we're great out here. And uh, you know, the only thing I wish we had a little more rain, but uh, everything else is good. Michael, we had this crazy um, hail event yesterday, which uh, I was in uh, on the 10 freeway out uh, near Monterey Park where our warehouse is located. And I'm not kidding when I tell you about a foot, I'm sorry, about an inch and a half of hail collected all over the place. It was like something I've never seen before. And uh, these were pretty good sized hail pellets coming down from the sky. Did you guys have that happen in Santa Barbara yesterday? We had it uh, in the Eastern part of the Valley and in Santa Barbara city, but on the West part of the, the county, nothing happened. It was just like little rainstorms. All right. Well, hopefully it's uh, returned to the beautiful weather that we've been seeing here in Southern California. And uh, you have to get up and visit with Michael and his wife. They also have a little store. We want to plug the store real quick, Michael. Yeah. My wife has a Los Olivos general store. It's on the corner of the flagpole in the town of Los Olivos. There's a lot of tasting rooms, um, some art galleries, but uh, my wife uh, did this really cute, uh, you know, sort of a modern take on old classic uh, with these, you know, home goods, bath and beauty products, jewelry, art, everything like that. So it's super fun. Fantastic. Well, um, I'm super happy that you can join me because you can not only correct my French pronunciation, <laughs> but um, uh, your experience in working with Gigal, um, a very famous producer, and uh, also gives you a, a lot of uh, detail and you receive the wines okay, buddy? Yeah, I'm all good, thank you, appreciate it. Did everybody receive the wines all right? Any, any issues out there? You can send me an email if it's something we don't wanna talk about. No casualties. Uh, we've got some fantastic folks on the Zoom uh, from all over the place and a lot of expertise on this uh, project as well. Uh, but I want to thank a couple of our regulars like Lisa Test and Stephanie Smith for joining us. Emily Little, good to see you again. David Cam, thank you so much, sir. Um, Tess, you get the prize for getting the, the wine sent the furthest. You're in Washington, Tess. Cool. We'll have to learn a little bit more about what, what is that an actual background behind you? Is that a big <laughs> Um, this is actually my work background. I work in wine, um, and my coworker who lives in the Bay Area recommended this. Wow, fantastic. Well, I'm super happy that we were able to do that with you. Melvin J., thank you for joining us. Matt Kettleman, good to see you, sir. How are you? How are you? 
I'm good. Thanks for having me. This looks like a uh, fun event, and uh, I'm excited to taste some really good wines and, and see my friend Michael Larner here helping us along. I've known Michael for a long time. I've known his wife even a little bit longer, actually. So, um, we'll hear, it's fun to hear what he's going to say, what he's going to teach us about. <laughs> Absolutely, Michael's always a teacher. And Matthew, you're you're a writer for the Wine Enthusiast and a couple other wine magazines too, right? Uh, yeah, I'm a senior editor at the Santa Barbara Independent, where I've been for 22 years now. Um, I didn't start writing about wine there, but well, I did start writing about wine there, but I haven't always written about wine there. Uh, and then I also write for Wine Enthusiasts. I review the whole Central Coast in Southern California, uh, and then occasionally write for other newspapers and magazines as well about about wine and food and other things as well. So, Very cool. Heather Jennings, thank you for joining us tonight. Ryan Lottie, thank you so much for being here. How are things in the universe of all things Tom Petty? Well, there'll be some exciting new Tom Petty in Atmos, which is this amazing multi uh, immersive multi speaker kind of format. Um, it's kind of like uh, experiencing music uh, in a really cool way. So we're working on that. Spectacular. Hector, I saw some photos today you were taking with the coach of the LA Rams at the parade. It was pretty amazing. Uh, holding the Lombardi Award was something amazing. Uh, and McVeigh was an emo 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 amazing moment also for shooting for the NFL today in this great city of ours, uh, the champs, LA, Ra uh, LA Rams. Cheers. I almost said LA Raiders, but I said LA Rams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we are all getting used to having a good football team again. It's been a yeah. while. So it was fantastic, fantastic show. Charles Metzger, thank you for joining us. Natalie and Neville. Is this your first time? You guys I don't know the last name, so uh, I'm guessing. No. Hi Ian. Hi. I can't Wait. With my brother Pierre. All right, all right. Well, thanks for joining us, and uh, appreciate you being here. Thank you, Robert. We're excited. Robert Santiago, thank you so much. Uh, William McNabb, cheers, mate. How hey, are how are you? Fantastic. Well, you're a wine writer up in San Francisco. Piedmont, California. Piedmont, close by. Yeah. The nicer neighborhood outside of the city. <laughs> All right. I'm looking forward to this. This is my first virtual tasting. Wow. All right. Well, I hope it, I hope you are excited about it. We do these yeah. every month. Uh, Barnett, thank you for joining us again, sir. And uh, there's some more folks to get involved. Patty O'Halloran, thank you for joining us. Scott Bigelow. And I know there's some more, but we'll uh, get you guys all involved. And please, uh, once once the wine starts flowing, um, hopefully you guys feel inclined to posting some comments on the chat. Um, but let's get started with our first wine. We're going to get right into it. We're on a tight schedule tonight with so much content to get through. And I hope the wines perform to your satisfaction. Hopefully everybody got uh, a copy of our email that went out with all of the details. You can actually click right on the wine in the email and go straight to it. If you wanna check it out a little bit more, there's some detailed notes on each of the wines. That's what we do at The Merchant. We spend a good amount of time sometimes loading the wrong information about the wrong wine, but uh, we fix it eventually. Uh, we also, uh, let's see here, let me get you off my, you don't wanna see all the terrible emails I got. We also on that email had a tasting mat and hopefully you got a chance to break that out and see the tasting mat. If you, uh, here, let me just show you that because some people just haven't explored this email. There is a little tasting mat by hitting that button. You should open up the tasting mat, which you can print and help you follow along. Of course, this time we put the little numbers on the jars and all that stuff too. Uh, name of the wine. Sometimes we don't get uh, quite that detailed, but we take the stars events really to a high level. And um, let's get going. Again, Michael Larner is joining us. So, Michael, uh, feel free to kick in. We're going to go straight to Bill Grant, who's our representative for Wilson Daniels. 
and we're going to meet Nicole Rollet in a video that we shot with her. Of course, uh, the Roan folks would love to be on with us tonight, but it is about four o'clock in the morning in the Roan Valley as we speak. So I came in very early each day and, and, and taped over the last couple of weeks with each of these folks to get them at their best. Um, and we're gonna be talking about Van Cluse, which is down here in the southern part of the Rhone. Of course, when we look at the map of France, you can see up here in the corner, the map of France, the Rhone Valley, pretty significant um, in size and stature. Um, then that Rhone River is really the defining force that created the Rhone Valley. And let's go straight into the video as we taste the 92 point decanter um, Alio Blanc, uh, which we'll uh, break down a little bit more in a moment. Um, Ian, may I ask a quick yeah. question? Please go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Um, which email has the, the mat with the order of the tastings? Uh, that should have come to you on a couple of occasions. So if you look at that one, that, that email carefully that has all the bottles on it, that should be there. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Thank uh, you. You betcha. And I'll, I'll tell you what, during the, when I get a second, I'll paste it into the chat box so you can have it too. Okay. And here we go with Nicole. The visit with your beautiful white wine. All right, so we are now in Ventoux with Nicole. Nicole, you're there now, right, at the estate? Absolutely. This is a real bookshelf. You want a beautiful backdrop? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Ventoux is not a place that many people have um, heard of before, but you're, you're in a very significant um, upper corner right next to Jingle Das at around, I'm sorry, I just tried to annotate that. Uh, right around 1,800 feet, 2,000 feet in elevation, which is quite high and up, up here in the corner. So um, it, it, it's quite a project that you have and a, quite an opportunity. And, uh, and uh, I've been reading about you for years and being able to meet you now on Zoom this for the second time, um, truly coming to appreciate the significance of your project. That's uh, an understatement, yes, project with a capital P because uh, it was completely abandoned way up at the top of this mountain in a little mountain saddle, a very, very special place, uh, more than a thousand years of history. But uh, you take this little winding road to the middle of nowhere and just when you think nobody could possibly live that far from everyone, that's when you get to our vineyard. So it's all about that elevation. It's very exciting to be there. And Bill is here to taste with us uh, the Chen Bleu Aliot Blanc, and or Alio, no T, correct? That's right. It's uh, named after an ancestor of the property, Aliot de Montvin, who in 1427 changed it to a glass blowing workshop, hence the name. Wow. There's always so many great ideas. I think we'll um, talk over the top of, of, of the tour of your estate. I'll probably have a little music for just a second. There we go. Elevation, historic property, and you guys uh, uh, acquired this property in what year? About uh, 25 years ago, and it was no water, no electricity, just a giant fig tree growing through the living room with a um, big hole going up to the sky, um, two meters of petrified sheep dung. <laughs> It was really uh, something else. <laughs> it took us forever to fix it up. But look at that amazing nature. I mean, the biodiversity is off the charts there. And I think that's our secret weapon, you know, being uh, so far away from civilization, having that fabulous forest around us in the heart of that UNESCO biosphere reserve with um, so many species. Uh, the biosphere has uh, 1,400 species just of butterflies, to give you an idea. And so it makes everything possible because you don't have to use chemicals. You just have nature on your side. So there were not uh, vines here or, or there were vines here when you acquired the property? They've been tending it since the Middle Ages on and off. We had Templar monks and these uh, old vines that we were able to take over, which um, 
uh, started off when they say in this, um, this 25 and, and 40 year old Grenache and Syrah, they're actually uh, like 78 years old now. It's really amazing. So that's just a gift from God to have this incredible uh, ancient vineyard to work with uh, its historic site. And as you know, there was such an exodus to the valley. Um, late uh, 50s everybody with tractors mechanization creation of cooperatives so they just abandoned these amazing historic properties and you can buy them for a song still still today i think it's one of the reasons that it's such an up-and-coming region and that so many people are getting so excited about the Ventu, and it's the the new hot thing certainly in, in our area but for france in general uh, it's because you can find these extraordinary micro terroirs with uh, microclimate microgeology and make some very distinctive wines there. Amazing. I, I, I think a lot of people are paying attention to that idea. Um, there's a lot of uh, Californians that have been finding new places to work in faraway places, whether it be Portugal or Spain. Maybe uh, maybe that's a good idea for Ventu is to create a uh, EU citizenship opportunity for US uh, investment. I love that, but I definitely would uh, help and encourage anybody who's looking for a rock star vineyard at a very uh, rock bottom price um, to come see because there's a, it's a very exciting place to work. Michael, any thoughts of uh, packing up shop in Santa Barbara and moving to the, the Rhone Valley? Oh, uh, very tempting. Um, I've been there. But, uh, you know, I, that whole area is beautiful. Mont Ventoux is beautiful. And, and um, uh, I am a sucker for sweet wines. So the Muscat Bombe de Venise sometimes. Uh, I love that stuff there. Awesome. Let me, uh, Bill, I'm looking for you. I'm trying to get my, uh, my little browser. I'm going to stop the share for a second so I can find you. Where are you, Bill? I'm over here somewhere. Uh, there you are. I'm going to spotlight you too so that we can taste this wine too. Uh, Nicole, I, there's a longer version of that video inside of the wine um, that's posted on the website. You can watch the entire it, it in its entirety. She truly is like genius material and uh, has an incredible um, life that she, she led before becoming a vintner. And now she's brought this amazing expertise and business savvy to an unknown appellation. And uh, she is making a huge difference and really carving it up. And one of the great feathers in their cap is that they've got one of the best importers, Wilson Daniels, that uh, imports brands like Domain Romana Conti and a bunch of the, the best, most ultra premium brands in, in Europe. And Bill Grant's with us today from Wilson Daniels. And uh, we are tasting this beautiful white. I'm gonna open up the, the PowerPoint again, just so we could see the, the notes in detail. <clears throat> but let's just geek out on this wine for a minute because the white wines of the Rhone, I think are really um, underserved in this, in this marketplace. And this is, this is a beauty, there are many, but this is just a spectacular version. And it's 65% Roussan, 30% Grenache Blanc, five Marsan with a touch of Viognier. Is there anything you'd like to tell people about this wine that makes it even more unique, Bill? I, I, I love the wine, the freshness of this. There, there are, as you said, a lot of great uh, white Rhones, uh, but because of where she's located in the elevation, um, it's a very warm, so anybody who hasn't been there, it's a very warm area. There's a lot of sun. Uh, the grapes never had a problem getting ripe, but what has always faced them is um, keeping freshness in the wine because of the, the heat. And so they're so far up in, in this little biosphere that she's created. That the wines are their own, you know, I've never had any anything like this before. Um, the, the freshness, the beauty that the, the just caresses your palate. I mean, it's absolutely a stunning little wine. As, as you guys are finding out right now, the, the, to me, the Roussons really uh, just takes over. I mean, the Grenache Blanc keeps it fresh, but that just, that kind of beautiful, um, you know, brioche honey style that, that, that I get out of there. It's just really, really spectacular. And she has done, you know, wonders. Again, she found this spot when it had been abandoned for 50 years and the passion, the amount of hard work it took for her and her husband to, to pull this together um, 
and really create something that was just special. It's just out of passion because there's not, you're not making a lot of money. If it wasn't a, you know, prime, it's not like going to the Napa Valley where, you know, okay, I'll just, you know, mark it up X, Y, Z and, and sell it. Really, they did just out of passion. They fell in love with the place. I think that really speaks to the ones that she makes. Um, Her husband, husband was the, uh, I think the president of the London Stock Exchange or something of that merit. Right. They come from a finance background. Yeah. And she worked for the Rockefeller Foundation and right. she brings it. All the all the tools in the shed are being used at this property in passion galore. They're being farmed uh, biodynamically <clears throat> mm -hmm. and uh, really maintaining very, very high ethos at every level. In fact, that's how I first discovered the wine in an article um, reading about the, you know, the wineries that are really pulling the, the, the highest cards and the highest ethos and they are listed amongst the top. Michael, uh, what do you, what kind of, uh, reflections are you getting in that first wine? You know, I, I, I make a lot of Rhone wines and Roussan's always been one that's been tricky because it, um, has a fattiness to it, like a waxy character. Uh, and what I love about this wine is none of that's there. It has bright, brilliant, uh, sort of crisp mineral. Um, I was looking at that slide and it talks about the limestone, the, the, you know, this marl. And so I almost feel like there's a minerality that's coming through on that, on that wine, which is really refreshing. And, um, and it's, it's, it's great because a uh, higher elevation, sometimes you have these tricky situations where you get too much solar radiation, but it seems like this is just really benefited from that. Fantastic. Any other comments, questions? And if anyone could uh, lead off the comments there, I see uh, Matt's uh, making a comment about Doug Marjoram. Santa Barbara was one of the early consultants there. Right. Yeah. Uh, very cool. But Matt, you mean uh, at Larner or? Uh, no, at, uh, at Shen Blue. She, no way. How cool. Yes. Doug, Doug actually helped her. He was her technically an, her first importer. And when she was learning, uh, like didn't know who to contact, she he actually helped bring the wines to the market. Yeah. Wow, that that, that that's great. And um, uh, Bill, uh, this is by the way, the 2016 is the current release at the winery. That they're that holding, is correct. They're holding correct. their wines until they believe that they can be presented. There is absolutely no uh, short window on this bottle of wine. It does have some. Uh, voluptuous tactile characteristics but there this is not going to run out of steam anytime soon no i think this this wine you know you got another 10 15 years easy these wines can develop and they go even like chateau of the pas blanc they're great at one stage when they're crisp and fun but then they develop into a whole nother genre and and equally fun and equally is is captivating so Tremendous, everybody. Thank you so much, Bill. And of course. An awesome way to start off our evening. I hope you guys agree. And uh, we appreciate you being here. Again, uh, uh, take a look. There's approximately, uh, I, I believe I purchased, Bill, all the inventory that there is on this wine, too. We're talking about a pretty <laughs> small production, uh, brought in a bunch. And what we've got left after we sold all the kits and the bottle kits and everything is, is about, a, about 12 bottles. Yeah. So if anyone likes it, um, you're not going to find it very many places. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, this is a smaller producer. And I'm just going to throw one more plug down. We're about to take a little trip in the first week of April to the Rhone Valley in Provence. And uh, we are working out a, a way to get to Chen Bleu as well and to meet with her in person and to go to this magnificent estate on that tour. So that's one of the, the many places we intend to visit. All right, let's get into our next producer, Maxime Grail. Uh, this is Crow's Hermitage, which we're bouncing all the way to the Northern Rhone to Crow's. Uh, we are down here in Ventu. Now we're going up to the north and we're gonna taste some Crow's Hermitage located and kind of surrounds the, the village of Ermitage, which we'll talk about a little bit later. On the other side of the river, you've got uh, Saint Joseph, and this is a really special wine, and this is a really special guy. Well, good morning, Maxime Grayot. Pleasure to meet you. Great to uh, see you. You're sitting where right now? Oh, home, because it's uh, it's not the morning for me, it's the evening, so 
it's 6.30, so, uh, and during the winter, you, as you can see in the window in the back, uh, you know, the night is coming. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, everything is fine. Thank you for hosting me. All right, everybody. So we're tasting the Crow's Hermitage, hmm. a long grayo, which is uh, Maxime's father. And Maxime is the winemaker for his father. And uh, this is a, a, a wine that it was started, you say, in 1985, Maxime? First yeah, the, vintage. Yeah, the first vintage of the domain is 1985. Which was a great first vintage. It is. And uh, this is a whole cluster uh, style. So the whole cluster, and we're talking about pure Syrah. Yeah, 100% Syrah, 100% whole cluster. No destemming ever. And and quite worldly, we've been talking about your world experience and it's been amazing. And uh, it's quite quite amazing how this has evolved. We're in Crow's Hermitage and I just wanna show people kind of how, where we are um, as we go up yeah. here. I'm gonna yeah. try to show yeah. everyone exactly where, right here, yeah. yeah? Exactly, this is the house and this is the farm. And if you just uh, do a, and the, the, we own 20, 20 hectares of Cros Hermitage and 19 are just, just here where the, where your black um, arrow is in this area. Yes, this area, exactly. This is all the 19 hectares. So in the, almost in one block. So that's very handy because it's very next to the winery. It's very homogenic in terms of expression. Most of the vineyards has been planted in the last, in the late sixties. So it's like. Uh oh. I just had a good morning power Maxime. shot. Sorry, so I'll get it back up there. This is a uh, amazing, and uh, it's quite quite amazing how this just uh, do a, and almost in one block. So that's very handy because it's very next to the winery. It's very homogenic in terms of expression. Most of the vineyards has been planted in the last, in the late sixties. So it's like 50 years old now. When you do work as we do hundred percent all cluster. If you do a, you know, like a math, a bit of math, you have one stem for hundred berries. This is, I would say the ratio between the fruit and the stems. I just want to show everyone, um, so you make the wine for your father, but you also yes. make wine for yourself. Yes. You you uh you worked in Burgundy. You studied in Burgundy. You worked for uh, the Cess family yeah. and uh, Domaine Jacques, which is like a whole cluster uh, yeah. Burgundy house. And then you worked in Burgundy for the other extreme. Exactly with the. 100% this time, very, very long time on skin, over 30 days, a lot of pushing downs, of punch downs, of pump overs, and a lot of new oak at Domaine de la Bougeray with Pascal Marchand. So it was just like Totally opposite. And then you work in Spain and you work in California. You made Turley Zinfandel. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> well, uh, in Crow's Hermitage, and of course tonight we're tasting across the entire Rhone Valley. Um, your father's wine is considered a classic and a, a great representative for, um, for Crows uh, and very well acclaimed. I got a picture of you. Uh, here's you and your brother. Uh, yes. and I've got a picture of uh, your father as well. So and, if you would have seen the vineyards with me through the window. Yeah. You would probably seen exactly the pictures you have uh, here next to my father's picture. Because the vines are pruned, there is no leaf, it's winter time, and the growing season will start probably in six weeks. So now the, now the, the vines are exactly looking on your picture. And uh, one of the reasons that you only see stones is because those winds are blowing through. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the wind, the wind is pretty strong. The, the specificity of Cros Hermitage here, um, and if you back to the, to the, uh, the first picture of the map, 
uh, you, you will check that the, 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 the cross Hermitage appellation is, we are, especially in the south of the appellation, we are really at the joining point between two rivers, the Rhone, which mm -hmm. is the main one coming from north, going to Mediterranean Sea, mm -hmm. and the Isère, which is the, the one who's coming from the, the right side of your map. Isère is coming from Val d'Isère, you know, the French Aspen, you know, Val d'Isère, and it comes and it's joined the Rhone exactly where, where we are, and this is why the, the name of the city I belong is Pont de l'Isère, which means a bridge over the Isère. And when we, we talk about your father's wine and being whole cluster, you're doing that in, uh, in concrete, uh, stainless yeah. steel? Uh, concrete. Everything, the, 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 the winemaking uh, wine is, is only done in concrete. You know, I love easiness and, and you know, the good sense and efficiency in winemaking. Concrete is perfect for not dealing the temperature of your winemaking. Do you, do you transfer from the concrete to wood, um, the wine at all, or is it always in concrete? Yes, all, all, all the fermentation are done in concrete, but then 100% of the wines are aging in, in, uh, in oak. Fascinating. So cool. And uh, uh, we're we're going to be bringing a group to the Rhone uh, soon, so hopefully I can meet you and we can meet in person. Tremendous morning, guy, Max. Tr tremendous guy, tremendous wine, famous uh, Crow's Hermitage production. Hope you guys are enjoying it. This is 100% Syrah, and uh, it's represented by uh, uh, Chambers and Chambers. And in a moment, we'll be going to Kermit Lynch for our next wine. But Michael, uh, any comments? Um, Matthew, anyone? Uh, William McNabb, anyone that has uh, an opinion about the wine? I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I just want to throw something in there from a geologic perspective. One of the amazing things about, um, you kind of touched on it, where there's two rivers meeting. There's very dynamic terrain in Hermitage, Tan Hermitage, Crow's Hermitage, which really revolves around the fact that you have very steep cliff uh, hillside selections. Oh. Um, and then it kind of comes down into more of like alluvial, and that's why you see all those rounded stones in the vineyard. So those are going to be slightly higher in clay um, and, and less of that steep terrain that you see on some of the other vineyards. So what I found amazing was I, when I worked for Gigal, we harvested vineyards in Crozer Hermitage and we harvested vineyards in San Josef, which have similar aspect. And the berries in Crozer Hermitage are bigger, um, darker skin. Uh, so make these wines with great complexity. And so it's fascinating because when I try this wine, I, I experiment with 100% whole cluster and I always find it to be very, uh, you know, bold and tannic. And this one actually has a nice soft elegance to it. So who knows? And that spice character that we get here is like a, like a textbook uh, Crow's Hermitage note. Without uh, as much, um, I, you know, maybe it's because of the concrete and, Things, but I thought these wines had, you know, quite a, a few problems with things like Britannomyces and other other issues, and they typically have a lot of barnyard uh, notes. Uh, but this Crows is so textbook and clean and pure and detailed and and really really enjoyable. Uh, Ian Bill yeah. McNabb here. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Whenever I think of Crows Hermitage, I think of barnyard. Yeah. I mean, really strong barnyard kind of on the objectional end. And it's nice. There's zero of that in this wine. It's fresh and clean, got great, you know, cherry and, and current. Um, it's not what I think of as a typical crows. Yeah, well, I, I think that it's um, I believe their first vintage was 85, which was a pretty legendary place to start. And uh, and uh, with uh, his son and, and quite a bit of uh, uh, success, the uh, innovation and a move away from the old, old wood vats that carry that Britannomyces and stuff is part of the evolution of, the, of fine wine. Um, and uh, for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, Britannomyces is a yeast, uh, kind of a spoilage yeast, right? Would that would be the category you could put that in, uh, Michael? Uh, yeah, or... yeah, it's a it's a spoiler juice, and one of the difficult parts about Britannomyces is 
it, um, it has like literally like a hundred uh, aromatic descriptors. Some of them, which we may pass off as being totally okay, like um, a leather or like a forest floor component, mushroomy. Um, some that are a little bit more, you know, not exactly politically correct, you know, the, the, the fecal, the barnyard, band aidy, these kind of things. And, um, and, and it's funny in the industry, Britannomyces has become a little bit of a, of a, you know, a fulcrum for people to get into spats because if you try some of these old wines, um, you run into that and that almost people think that that's the definition of it. And it's like, well, not really. I mean, that's why it's fun trying a wine like this because it's clean. It shows the essence of the land more than maybe some tainted of the winemaking. Cool. And Matt, thanks for uh, touching the, the chat box. You're putting in some great comments. Um, some old riper Paso Syrahs of the past uh, touched some of that potentially. Uh, yeah, I'm always um, surprised when, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, California winemakers who emulate French wines and then you try some French wines, you're like, wow, these are actually pretty big ripe wines. Uh, I, mean, I think the difference sometimes is that this, this has all that structure to like make it work, right? Like a lot of times when you get too ripe in California, it's just ripe and then flabby and that's it. Uh, and then in France, it seems to be that there's that tannic structure to, to uh, kind of keep it in bounds and everything. So, Yeah. We're at 13.5 alcohol on this wine. So uh, you have to work pretty hard to get your wine down there in, in Paso. But um, I do see some efforts in keeping the, the, the balance. It doesn't have to be a low alcohol or re, re, restrained in alcohol, but balance has uh, become a, a bigger part of the, the wine community up there all right let's uh let's go into uh wine number three we're moving right along and we're almost keeping uh on time so i uh, thank you and here we go with wine number three and let me introduce uh andrew major i'm gonna find you andrew in just a second and have your comments on saying to caillou as we hang out with Serge and his son. And here we go. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, Los Angeles coming in live to Vacara, where we have Serge and Frederi from Seng de Caillou. And also in New York, uh, Jane Berg with Kermit Lynch. And we're very pleased to be able to present the wine of Seng de Caillou. It's been a favorite of mine since I was first introduced to the wine to the wine, sitting at the French Laundry um, early in its its existence. And the sommelier came and brought me a beautiful bottle. And uh, it's a great pleasure to meet you, uh, Serge and Frédéric. Thank you. And we're good. Yeah, it's great to meet you. Well, let's go into our PowerPoint. And uh, we'll go through um, these slides with our group. And uh, thank you for joining us for the stars of the Rhone Valley wine. First of all, you're located in Vacara, which is in the Southern Rhone, uh, very, very close to Chateauneuf de Pape, Rome de Venise, and here's Vacara, right in here. The wine we're tasting, the 2019, uh, Florio, Florier. Florette. 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 It's a Provencal name. And uh, each year you make a couple different cuvee. Yes. Um, and they, this uh, is the name of one of your daughters? Yes. Yes. I, I have three daughters, Florette, Ducinelle, and Azaraïs. Each year the name change, but the the wine is the same, of course, quite the same, <laughs> of course, with the climate of each year very different, and we have a, a right white right wine and another cuvee of red called Lopi. It's old vines cuvee. And you have achieved uh, biodynamic and biodiverse. Uh, um, and quite a few uh, um, accolades here in your vineyard management. 
keeping things very uh, sustainable and healthy for the planet. We try for that, yes. What was your motivation to do that so early? Because you've been certified biodynamic since 2010, which is very early. Uh, for me, it was not so early because when I bought the domain in 1990, it was already my idea, my first idea to, to, to work in a bi biodynamic way. But the life is uh, sometimes uh, difficult and we learn, it's very difficult to, to do what we want uh, very, very, very uh, easy. Sorry. <laughs> so we, we, we tried biodynamic in 2008 and we are certified from uh, 2010. Yes. This is the, the vineyard that you uh, purchased in, uh, what, what was that, 1990 or 1980? I bought it in 1990. 1990. Yes. And these uh, vines were planted in what year? Most of the parcels are planted in 1980. So uh, the, uh, the parcel, the, the, the pictures, the, the parcel was planted in. Good morning. Uh, this is, uh, I'm sorry about that. Andrew, let's kick in. Hey, uh, thanks for having us. Uh, yeah, I mean, this this wine is a, is a personal favorite. I've been to the winery, I've met him and I think the wine kind of tastes a little bit better after seeing the winemaker and that mustache. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, he was intimidating uh, prior to the video and he was, I felt like he didn't want to speak because he, you know, limited uh, English, but yeah. I understood him so well and I wanted him to like me so much, but <laughs> man, that the, and I love that mustache. Yeah. Yeah. He owned that thing. <laughs> he does. Um, I, you know, I always think a lot of, the, the good wines tend to reflect the person who makes them. And, you know, this, this wine has a very um, uh, deep soul in it. It's, it's rustic. It's, it's from land that's, that's seen a lot of things. And uh, there's a lot of good wild cherry, garig, leather. There's a, there's a smokiness to it. Uh, it's an area that's very rustic. Uh, this to me is a, is a very rustic wine with a, with a smooth elegance to it. Um, you know, there's a lot of red clay, limestone, and, and rounded stones in this area. And yeah, I mean, to me, this, this tastes and, and smells like a wine from who it was made from and where it was grown. Yeah, there's a consistency here inside of this brand. And I, uh, you know, you kind of go through life and sometimes you connect to a wine. And that, that experience I had at French Laundry was the first time I ever ate a French Laundry. And I worked for for Chef Thomas Keller when he was here in LA. And um, so I had kind of a, 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 a magical experience with it that night. And every time I go to the French Laundry, I always try to order this wine. In fact, I think they sell it by the Magnum there, which is the secret, because the secret used to be for French Laundry anyway, that you get the eight person room and uh, you share Magnums all night because they are uh, a value on the uh, on the French wine uh, laundry wine list, which uh, it's hard to say in the same sentence, but um, uh, really uh, a, a magical place to experience these wines. And uh, there's there, this wine is just a personal preference, but I I just love love this wine, and it's been such a great performer, and uh, I, I think a lot of fans out there. So um, I thank you for allowing us to include it in the stars of the Rhone Valley. It's a personal treasure, and uh, these wines age like wonderful. Yeah. Uh, uh, wines that can really extend them out. And if you get a chance to taste one with some bottle age on it, five to 10 years uh, is about as old as I've seen them go, but um, I'm, they might be going a lot longer than that. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've done some tastings there where the, the winemakers won't pour anything, um, you know, as recent as five to 10 years. And um, these are great values. I mean, if this is a wine that you like, um, these are easy to find. They're not very expensive. And um, it's just, a, it's another area that's a lot of fun to explore and you don't have to drop a lot of money on it. Awesome. I'm, I'm getting some really nice comments about the wine in the 
in the browser. Shrink. I actually um, was able to buy some at auction, and yeah. it was twenty. It was two thousand two. This was a couple of years huh. ago, and it was amazing how how young and fresh the wine was. That's amazing. Very cool. Gotta find Michael, some. Anything to add on this one before we move on? Yeah, you know, I was, I was, uh, and my French is way better when I drink, so we'll be we'll be fluent by the end of this. Uh, <laughs> but um, La Song de the Caillou is basically a sort of a, the blood of stones or blood of these particular stones that you find in that area. And I find that really kind of an interesting uh, name for this wine because in, or in this particular winery because I I get that iodine sort of um, meaty core in this wine, which is uh, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, and I, I think somebody commented, I, I don't know the, the breakdown of the grapes off the top of my head, but a lot of uh, that area has high Grenache content. And um, so that would be really amazing to see that. Yeah, um, I'll shift it out to everybody. Let me open that up and, and here we go. Yeah, it's 70% Grenache, 20% Syrah, and then 10% Mavedra and Sinsa. There you go. And uh, also, that entire video, uninterrupted, is available right there on the wine. Uh, and that's what we do with these little clips that we make uh, as we put them on all of the star wines so that you can go and see them. Um, and I won't mess them up. If I can throw something in really quick, too, uh, Ian. Um, Grenache is uh, a, a, a grape and a wine of many different colors. And this is a gorgeous example of, you know, Grenache it has some Syrah blended in there, but it's a gorgeous example of Grenache that shows structure, tannin and, and elegance. And, and it's, I'm, I'm thinking if at some point someone's going to comment like, won't this remind you of California? I'm like, nothing. This is very unique and distinct. Uh, and that's really quite a, a, an accomplishment. And like, um, like we said, wait. almost every year of a, a winner, it's uh, a signature and style. Uh, Judith. Thanks, Ian. I'm um, sorry to interrupt again. You mentioned that 2010 was an early player in the biodynamic scene. Can you speak to that a little bit more as far as California, France, and who were really some of the biodynamic pioneers? Well, to be uh, concise about that, um, you know, biodynamics has become part of, a part of our, vernacular. our vernacular, um, but uh, really is a uh, highly uh, regulated now. And uh, there's a couple of agencies that do it. Here in California, you'll find a lot of Demeter certified wineries. But in, in Europe, they've actually created their own biodynamic standards. And there's a number of competing agencies. So uh, that whole um, uh, monitorization and, and being able to legitimize wineries as actually biodynamic is a really important step. Otherwise, you'd have a lot of wineries claiming that they're biodynamic and they've only been practicing for a little while. There's a there's a huge amount of lead time that you need to be operating biodynamic to establish full on biodynamics where you have a self regulating ecosystem inside of your own. And you have to have your own ecosystem. That means you have to have a pretty significant property without any neighbors to impact your ecosystem. So that's the that's the balancing act and really uh, tough to achieve. Um, and a huge commitment because you are basically taking off all the safety precautions and, and letting uh, your daily work in the vineyard be your, your backstop. So it's really an important, uh, uh, important designation and, and something to pay attention to for the future because it's going to continue to become a more increasing part of our, our world. All right. Thank you. And Andrew, just stay right there because we're going to move right into our next wine. Uh, which is yours, and, uh, and you being with Kermit Lynch, one of the great uh, French portfolios on the, in the world, and and uh, we we love the wines of Kermit Lynch. And uh, good morning. We pass that all on there. Oh, uh, and just for th those of you that didn't get all of the slides, uh, decanter ninety three on this wine. I'm not sure if I've even got that score on the website yet. Um, but uh, you know the vines are now four, approximately 40 years of age, and those uh, those stones are called galets. So you might see that um, those rounded rocks that are so pervasive because uh, because of those winds. And literally, when we were recording these messages in that time period for about 10, 15 days in a row, these winds blow so hard that they can even be known to drive people crazy. 
because they're like Santa Ana's, but they never relent. They just keep coming for days and weeks. And so the topsoil is all gone and all you've got are those big stones standing there. All right, so we move on with uh, Lionel Ferry and uh, Lionel, Lionel Ferry. And now we're going back up north to Saint Joseph. And uh, <clears throat> this is a, a wine that uh, Andrew introduced me to a while back. And we're tasting uh, a, a special wine from the house. The old vines are VA Vine. Whenever you see VA Vine, that means old vines. And uh, th this is a selection in the vineyard or early plantings that we really kind of separate the, the wines a little bit. And not all, not all old vine wines are the same uh, or is, you know, on par or equal merit. But when uh, the people in the Rhone say old vines, they're talking about some pretty old vines. Uh, Andrew, I'll play the video and then we'll get some comments. Lionel Ferry. Uh, he is live with me now, sitting in the Rhone Valley. Lionel, good morning. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm great, fine. What about you? I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm waking up here. It's a little early for us. We're recording for our stars of the Rhone Valley. And Lionel's family is uh, very well regarded. And uh, today we're tasting a Saint Joseph with, with you and uh, your team. And we are very excited to be able to meet you in person. So thank you for the personal touch. My pleasure. Uh, you've grown up in the in the family winery, yes? Yeah, uh, I live in uh, Chavanay for um, nearly forty years now. So yeah, I was involved in the in the wine uh, since my my birth. <laughs> the first days, huh? Um, is your father still involved? Uh, he's not re retired yet, but uh, yeah, I like to have uh, an eye sometimes to to do wine growing or wine making. Mm. Very good. And when did he pass the baton to you? Uh, how many years has it been? Uh, uh, it's almost uh, 15 years as the, I took over in uh, 2006 uh, vintage. and. Um, yeah, so um, as I am the youngest son of the, the family, I have to, to took over pretty early. So I was 20, just 22, so. Oh, wow. Well, um, it's wonderful to get to meet you and we're excited to taste the wine. Uh, let me go into a slideshow and yeah. we can show everybody a little bit more detail. First of all, we're in the Northern Rhone um, we've got uh, uh, Coroti, Condriou, and as you come down the Rhone, uh, the river runs in this direction, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. From the top to the to the bottom. Yeah. From the from the Alps, and the the Rhone goes to the the Mer Mediterranee, which is on the, the southern part. Uh, yeah. And then, is it is it a river that you uh, can swim? in or take a boat uh, do you ever get in the river uh yeah you can you can have a swim but it's pretty pretty cold because the um, uh, the water comes from the alps so yeah that's not so so common to to see people uh, swimming on the on the run river but uh, there is many many you can do some cruise uh, on the run from the from marseille to to lyon mm -hmm. very good um, we will also look at a sec at, get a little closer look here um, as we see Saint Joseph. We sh see Chateau Guyer up near Condrieu. You are sitting in in the and can you pronounce the town for me? Uh, we are located in Chavanay. So Chavanay is a, is a little city located on the on the very northern part of the, the Saint Joseph Appellation, and uh, Chavanay is also allowed to produce Condrieu Appellation. Ah, great! This is a pretty specific place uh, on the northern run because the the commune is allowed to to produce two two appellation. And so we are. Yeah, and we are just on granitic soil. And yeah, granitic soil. 
And uh, that's something I think is very distinctive about your wine and the, uh, the, the terroir that comes shining through. We, there's different levels of Saint Joseph. You make um, a Vie Vin, old vine, which is, Vie Vin means old vine, and you make uh, a non-old vine. How old are, are the vines that we're tasting today? This bottle of wine is made uh, from the oldest vineyard we own, and uh, the vineyard is between 45 and 60, 60 years old. So, um, yes, this is the, the oldest person we own on the Saint Joseph. Outstanding. Here we're talking about Syrah, grown in granite on hillsides. Oh with 70 to 80% of the grapes are whole cluster. Uh, fermentation is around 15 to 20 days. Pump overs occurring twice a day. Um, then it's aged for 15 months in oak demis, which are 600 liter a large cask um, or barrel. Um, and uh, and then you blend them together to create the old vine. So first we are on granitic soil, so the, the soil are very rich in, in minerals. And uh, so we are on the, on the, on the northern Rhone, uh, which is a pretty hot climate. But the granite soil gives lots of freshness, of elegance. Uh, the northern Rhone Syrah has to be in this way. This is pretty powerful, uh, powerful wine, but uh, the tannins are very, very smooth. And um, so I like to, to think about more infusion uh, compared to, to extraction because of the granitic soil. And I like to, to age the, the wine for 15 to 18 months to soften the, the tannin and to have the, the, right, uh, the right taste. Well, we thank you for making time for us today. Um, getting to speak with you hopefully allows our, our, our friends that are watching uh, a chance to break away from sitting in, behind their computer and kind of pretend like we're visiting you in person. And someday maybe I get to meet you in person. We are coming to the Rhone and we'd love to uh, see you and be able to visit. That would be my, my pleasure to, to host you at the domain uh, here in Chavane. All right. Andrew, thank you for arranging for that interview with him. Very nice man. We talked for extended period of time um, and uh, was really, really insightful. And I want to thank you for, for bringing that together. Did you get a chance, Andrew, to taste uh, this wine? And, and what how's it treating you? Absolutely. Um, this is a a personal favorite of mine um and to me when you smell and drink san joseph you know it's san joseph it just can't be any other any other wine um and you know he touched on this being a very old vineyard uh the vines planted from um 1937 to 76 um and why old vines is important is that the, the longer those vines are alive, the deeper and deeper they go down into the soil, down into the bedrock and pick up a lot of nutrients and minerals and, and aspects that, that you're not gonna get from very fertile uh, topsoil up at the top. And so the more those vines can struggle and, and try to get further and further down into the ground, the more concentration and, and just more goodness that's <laughs> deep below the surface that they can bring and pump into their, into their vines. Um, and so that's why when, when we talk about, for those who are, are new to this, talk about old vines and why that's so special. Um, but um, going back to this wine, you know, it's a, it's a cooler climate. You're not getting the rusticity that you do from like from the Vaccara. Um, it's, it's cooler. It doesn't get overly ripe. Um, this, is, this is an area where it really allows the Syrah to shine and, and be Syrah. And I'm personally... Uh, a big fan of, of Syrah. And so I, I really enjoy this one a lot. Hmm. Ian, if I may ask a question. Please go ahead. Uh, the second one we, hi, the second one we tasted was 100% Syrah as well. 
And I find that there is such a difference between that wine and this one, this last one, which is so rounded, so so well balanced and so velvety. And the first one that are the, the first one being number two, which almost gave you a puckering at the end and a really uh, kind of edgy, uh, rough finish on the tongue. And so since they're very close in mm-hmm. area, in, in their uh, mm-hmm. geographic area, what makes that difference? Or is it just the processing that allows that? Michael, did you did you have? Any yeah, idea? you bet. I'll jump in on that one. Um, they are. They seem like they're very close, but they're not. Uh, and and to, to exacerbate that, the soils are completely different. Um, the, he talked about granitic soils. Um, it, it's like sitting on weathered granite. Uh, it is crazy. It's almost a, uh, like a lunar landscape out there. Um, you know, some of those photos you see grass, that's not that common. It's very sort of, um, you know, just pure granite uh, decomposed. Um, and when, you, when you're trying the, the ones that are further south, like Hermitage, Crow's Hermitage, um, those are, you know, I mean, literally, that, there's no scale on that map, but it's probably a good 10 minute drive between the two, 10, 15 minute drive. And the, it opens up there and the river uh, has much more influence, whereas San Joseph is just cliff face uh, exposures. Um, so it's both Syrah, but growing in very different uh, strata. Okay. Mar- Mars, and Venus. Mars and Venus. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, but I, you know, what I like about them is that they're, they're, they're Thank you. So, they are so close to each other on the map but so far apart and and that's why i think uh you know it it gives every winemaker hope to be able to make something uh that can fall between a, a, a very large spectrum in winemaking in different heats and different st- stone and minerality and different uh, very different conditions and uh, uh i'd be curious uh, to, to read some of the comments which i haven't had a chance to do um and see what uh people um, are saying about the two wines because I, I do think that the rusticity is still there inside of the crows whereas maybe in this wine it's a little bit more uh, richer um, and uh, but that stony characteristic um, holds you to being in a, in a, in a, in a cooler part of, of the Rhone Valley. Um, but I, but the, the, I could be I could be persuaded to describe that a little differently. You know, Ian, one, one of the things that I find um, interesting, if you're, if you're comparing the two Syrahs, like from Crows or San Josef, um, but also just in general, the regions that the wines that are further south that are still Syrah based bring in lush and rich characters, whereas wines that are further north, like Cotouti, San Josef, um, are, there's a little angular character to them. So they're not this like voluptuous red character, but they have this beautiful sort of straight to the point on you know the the mineral core or the tannin or and this is you know very velvety and smooth at the same time so it's, it's you know it's amazing that it literally it's it is Syrah grown in a similar region but in a very different uh, context yeah great great way to describe it well we thank you andrew for representing kermit lynch so well and now we move on to wine number five. And uh, we are going to move into, let me get uh, out there past the video. Uh, Ian Pritchard is joining us tonight. Ian, uh, thank you for joining us from Winebow. And uh, thank you for arranging for the interview with Isabelle Sabon. And uh, we're gonna be tasting Chateau Neuf de Pop with Janas. One of my all-time favorites, Domaine de la Jeunesse. And uh, this is a 98-pointer. This is their old vine. Um, and uh, let's let's hear it from her. Oh, next, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so pleased to be able to meet you, Isabella Sabon, winemaker at Domaine de la Jeunesse. And uh, I, I've been a... I'm a very active consumer of your wine for my entire wine career, and it's a real pleasure to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Isabel Sabon, joined from France. 
Hi, everybody. <laughs> Pleasure. And we are now in Chateau Neuf de Pop. Chateau Neuf de Pop being uh, the famous blessed city of, um, by the Pope back in about the 1400s um, near Avignon. And if you go, zoom in here, we've got a, a really nice map that will leave all of it. But you can see where it's at in the southern part of the Rhone near Avignon. And Isabel uh, pointed out this fantastic map of the Chateau Neuf de Pop region where there are five, are they commune, Isabella? Yes, five towns, small village, <laughs> Courtaison, Chateau Neuf du Pape. Orange, Bédaride, and Sorgue. Yes. So, from the domain of Janas, we are just on the town of Courtaison, so on the east part of the appellation. And these color variations show the different types of soil, the pink being clay and the yellow being sand. So we have both clay and sand inside of, uh, inside of your vineyard. Yeah. And on, on the East part of the town of Courtaison, we have a lot of uh, sandy soil, uh, which bring a lot of uh, freshness and the finesse to the wine. So it's very interesting. The wine that we're tasting today is the 2019 Domaine de la Janas. Am I saying that okay, Isabella? Yeah, it's a great vintage, <laughs> very great vintage. Young but uh, very powerful vintage. 19 was uh, just a uh, very exceptional vintage with a lot of concentration, warm, uh, warm weather during the, the, the summer, and so uh, very concentrated uh, flavor. Very interesting. And if uh, we were to acquire some uh, bottles of this wine, what, what do you expect the optimal drinking time to be? Is, three, five years, 10 years, longer? Oh, longer, I think. I think um, you, you can drink on the fruit, but uh, you have to be canned uh, when it's young. And then uh, for me, it's a bottle you can keep uh, on the old vines, uh, perhaps uh, 20 uh, years and more. Very good vintage. Very good. And some exceptional scores and comments uh, throughout the press. Uh, with 98 points from the wine enthusiast. Mm -hmm. It's a photo of your father. And yeah. he, he acquired uh, this vineyard and the, started the brand in 1973. But yeah. there were already some older vines in the vineyard. Uh, mostly Grenache. Yes. A few part of Syrah and Mauvais, but uh, we love the Grenache. <laughs> And uh, these round stones that uh, the dramatic stone soils of, of uh, Chateauneuf de Pop, they're rounded because the Rhone River, such a significant, strong body of water, moved these rocks for hundreds and hundreds of miles and rounded these stones. And they ended up all around Avignon in this beautiful wine region. Yes. Uh, the, the the crew here um they're harvesting uh, do you also have white varieties in your vineyard yes a little uh, but the white it's a very small uh, production it's uh, just 10 percent of the production so we do mainly red right, uh, wine and here's the entire family yep. isabel, <laughs> isabel and christophe um are in the cellars now and their, their father is still involved in the vineyard and uh when did you start uh, taking on winemaking responsibilities? I come back to the domain in 2002. My brother in 91 and me in 2002. It was, uh, I think, the, the, the worst uh, vintage uh, of, the, of this, uh, this year. But we begin with a very bad vintage and it's a good, uh, uh, good thing to after uh, uh, Going in the easier uh, year after year, so it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us about this this wall in the vineyard. Oh, it's uh, my father who brings the the stones uh, to do a wall against the the wind 
because uh, it's a vineyard uh, on the on the, the top of a hill and uh, with a lot of wind and during the, the summer it's very warm uh, wind and uh, too warm so it burns the, the grapes and the, the grapes are um, too much concentrate it's a white uh, vineyard so we have decided to, to put this wind to protect to see this wall to protect uh, against the wind yeah that that warm wind would act, act like a convection oven in uh, the vineyard, uh, a warm mm -hmm. oven, like baking the fruit with the wind. Mm -hmm. So uh, fascinating. And everything is picked by hand in Chateauneuf de Pop. Yes. And it's part of the selection process. Uh, and sometimes you use a little bit of stem inclusion when it's uh, it's it's good for the wine. Yeah, yeah. And uh, like uh, the vintage you are, you are going to taste, the 2009. 19. It's a very poor food vintage and uh, very concentrated. So we have a high uh, alcohol, and to to balance this high alcohol, we keep uh, some uh, stems, and uh, it gives, of course, some tannin, but a lot of freshness. And so it's very interesting, and it's why it's vintage you can keep very long time. Oh, I can't wait. And uh, again, this there are a number of different cuvées that you make. Uh, this yeah. is one of the top, the VAB. Yeah. And mm. uh, how old are these vines? Oh, between uh, 80 and 100 years old. Wow. Mm. And this is a region that uh, there's no irrigation. No. So everything is natural. And yeah. It looks like a, a very sustainable uh, photo mm -hmm. with the beautiful uh diversity biodiversity throughout the vineyard mm -hmm. oh, fantastic next, uh, listen. uh we're tasting uh, domaine de la jeunesse via uh 65 grenache 20 morved 10 syrah and uh five percent divers which i believe uh was is a a, a a colloquialism for other varieties is that uh does that sound true Yeah, I should have to know if they have so many different grapes that at some point they just can't label them all. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Ian, I see you out there. Let me just have you say hello to everybody. And uh, um, I can't hear you yet, but uh, just hit that unmute button. Um, we've got the wine in our glass, Ian and, and Michael. I love to hear some comments from you guys, and hopefully everyone's putting a, a few comments in the chat. But uh, this is devastating wine. I agree, and, and, and you know, Ian, can you put up that um, Chateau Neuf map real quick oh, sure, sure. with the, with the uh, different communes? Because it it needs to be said that um, Chateau Neuf has a tremendous amount of diversity within that specific area, mm -hmm. and it, it's it's hard to fathom that in one area you have like Galais and clay soils, and another area you have this like almost beach sand kind of layer and there's always been discussion between the producers where is you know uh, are wines that are coming from that sand about finesse and elegance or are they about power and structure and it's really fascinating when you taste wines through that the different communes to start to see how that plays out i found the map give me a moment and i'll be able to bring it up but uh that's it's harder than that. Uh, let me see. Here we go. And uh, nope, it's not popping up. Sorry about that, Michael. No worries. But I was going to point out too. Um, the I'm, I'm not sure if it was mentioned earlier, but um, the geologic past of that area is what's called a terminal moraine on a glacier, and so it it's basically this retreating glacial front depositing large rocks and, and, and carving sections out, replacing it with clay and boulders and stuff like that. And so when you're, when you're looking at these different communes, you have to envision at some point, this was all covered by ice and, and, and basically being carved out. And then as it retreated, it basically the, the meandering you know, streams coming out of that glacier put all these different deposits. So that's one of the reasons why it's, it speaks to all these different communes 
because it's all these different pockets left over. Yeah, it's a uh, very different terroir. Um, even though it's a single appellation, um, there's many different interpretations and styles uh, based on the producer. And uh, this is one of them, one of the great ones. Um, Matt uh, Kettleman, what do, you, what do you think of this this wine tonight? Um, I was, I'm pretty impressed. You know, I, my, one of my colleagues gave it a 98 and when I'm scoring wines and um, you start to get above like the 94 level, you're really looking for uh, layers and layers and layers of, of flavor and texture and all that. And you, and you want length, right? You want it to actually kind of change from when it gets in your mouth, when you're sitting there a few minutes later and there's still something happening and this does all of that. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with that. I mean, honestly, when I first kind of put my nose in, I was like, Oh, it smells a little ripe. I guess I taste a lot of really kind of under, under ripe, uh, bright, fresh wines here on the central coast, which is, which is a good thing, I think. But, um, and then when I tasted it, it just kind of like exploded and, um, kept going and going. So, um, I'm all for it. I've been wanting to go to the Rhone for a long, I've been to Burgundy. I've been to Bordeaux. I've been wanting to go to the Rhone for a long time. And this is only uh, making me start looking at, you know, plane flights. So. Cool. We leave on April 3rd if you want to come. All right. Or we, we start on April 3rd, so you can join me. Uh, Ian, thank you very much. Uh, how's the wine treating you? It's phenomenal. I'm, I'm loving it. It uh, One of the notes I put was, this would have been perfect yesterday with that uh, hailstorm. Um, <laughs> I, I caught it at the Rose. I was, li I was literally next to the Rose Bowl when that hit. Um, so, But uh, no, the, the warmth on it, the, the rich flavors... I just wish I would have had some Osabuco tonight for dinner, um, but I'm still enjoying it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for bringing it to us. Thank and you. I appreciate everyone's uh, contribution. All right. Well, uh, I am super pumped as we move into our sixth wine. And uh, we have had so many special guests in, in this uh, gathering tonight. Um, I'd like to find Mr. Shivrick out there. Here. How are you? Very well, thanks. Nice awesome. to see you. Yeah. I know it's getting uh, late. In, you're in New York right now, right? No, 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 no. I'm uh, in, I'm in uh, Los Angeles. Are you? Okay. Yeah. I thought you were in New York. I, that's how it felt like I was communicating with Back East. <laughs> but, uh, uh, thanks for, for uh, coming on and joining us. And, of course. Uh, uh, we have the, the pleasure of uh, pre presenting Shav, and um, Mr. Shivrick is a, is a champion importer himself and uh, been written about in a lot of uh, uh, different publications in the wine industry, top personalities in wine, and uh, just a real, real pleasure to have you on our Zoom to talk about the wines of Shav. Sure, it's my pleasure. <clears throat> so let me get our, our little PowerPoint open. And, uh, and we'll begin. So uh, Jean-Louis Chave uh, is, is all, um, amongst the, the top producers in Hermitage and, uh, and makes a number of great wines uh, in and outside of the Hermitage Appalachian. Um, and I'm gonna let you speak about it because uh, I'm, I'm going to not do it justice and you, and you have so much great content. I only have a couple of slides and I'm gonna get out of the slideshow so we can hear your, your great uh, stories as we taste the Shab Hermitage. Okay, I'll do my best. The, okay, the, um, you see Herm Hermitage on the map, <clears throat> Northern Rhone, it's a, Someone was saying earlier that Saint Joseph is more north and Hermitage was south, but they they face each other. Um, and Shav is his first wine from 1481 was a Saint Joseph, just up the river. Oh, fantastic! In this place and and you do have a, a a slide of that that vineyard site. Um, okay. But here you've got the Rhone River was flows south. And if you go back to the other map, go to the, the, the there, okay, yeah. uh, it's tough to see. You can't really see it, but the, the, the um, vineyard, go back to the Hermitage map. This isn't showing so much. <clears throat> the, the 
on the left bank. I remember when a river, river in France, in Europe, you know, you call left bank, right bank. Uh -huh. That you don't have to say north, south, east, west, because the river always turns. Left bank is as you go down the river. It's the bank on the left. So the left bank is the Drome. This is the, the department, the county, the state of Drome, which is orchards and uh, not much for, and it's fairly flat and not much for wine. <clears throat> the right bank is the, the Ardèche. And that's where all the, the, the mountains are and the great vineyard sites are. <clears throat> now, the, uh, the river left, it cut through the, 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 the um, central massif here, the, the um, mountain range and left Hermitage on the left bank even though it is described geologically in every other way as right bank hmm. terroir. Hermitage, and you can see here the purple is Hermitage, it faces full south. Hmm. If it doesn't face full south, it's not Hermitage. So it's like the slope is, is, is going in that direction south. Yeah, Got it's it. facing, you see it, it's facing full south. Um, and that you have about well, maybe 12 to 15 different lieu de climat right. mm -hmm. in Hermitage. Chave mm -hmm. has the luxury of, although he only owns, well, he owns 15 hectare of Hermitage, which is probably 85, 90 hectare as an appellation. So he has 15, he's, a, I, I believe he's the third largest owner. Hmm. The two larger ones are Negociant. So he's a domain that is, he has the luxury of uh, fruit from nine different climat. The person, the grower or Negociant who has the next most multiplicity of vineyard sites is, uh, has three. So no one else can do what Shab does in the blending, and that's what he believes in. Um, here, and here you he, can actually see that south-facing slope that we were no. discussing, and how the river river kind of winds back and forth down below it. Yeah, you can. Yeah, <clears throat> the um, and and so Shab he makes a a, a blend every year. And he chooses the fruit from the different vineyard sites. It's about a six month process where he he's probably not very friendly to his wife. You know, he's he's dreaming about about uh, the blend. And he'll make choices on the what what he puts in the blend according to the that vintage that year. It's never the same. He has no idea what it's going to be. And the wine that you're tasting tonight, Farconet, is what does not go into the final blend of the of his, let's say his big domain Hermitage. Mm. Uh, it's still Hermitage in every way. These aren't younger vines or anything like that. It's just wines that didn't fit into what he thought was the conception of that vintage. Um, and for years, he used to sell the, this, this um, these grapes, no, this wine, to the trade. And finally, you know, I tried to. I said, "Show me, why don't you bottle it?" So finally, he did. About <laughs> he started bottling it about 15, 20 years ago. <laughs> I think he was finally fed up with seeing wine lists and other wines from Hermitage, where they would have, they would say. This was actually from Domain Shav. <laughs> right. We bought the grapes from Shav, or we bought the wine from Shav. Well, he, he got tired of that, I think. So he's um, he makes wine now, and I, I think so. I'm not tasting it. I'm unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm tasting a 2017 Domain Hermitage. Oh. I didn't have the Farconet, so um, I'll try to extrapolate as best as I can. <laughs> 
Um, I, and when I look at the sales side, there, uh, I've seen vineyards organized this way, like in Germany, this kind of single cane uh, uh, training so that the, the shadowing and, and everything and the, the, the wind and everything is, uh, and they, they really train these. They, this is a lot of work. Very yeah. high density too. This is a, Hermitage is unique. Central Seth does it too. Uh, not sure if Coat Routine, Coat Routine might as well. They, they've got these, uh, these Shaplo they're called. They're, they're long stakes and they're two that cross and the vines go up that. And you can maybe see, you can see how they're, 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 the vines are going up a stake. Yeah, that's what they're doing. You can't really make out the stakes here, but you can a little bit if you look closely. Yeah, but that's what Hermitage does. That's the, 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 okay, now this is Lens. This is up the valley a little bit uh, on the right bank in Saint Joseph. And these vines are facing full south and it is granite mm. and it's magnificent. And this is the original vineyard of Shav. And, you know, Shav, you look at the label, it says, well, What's your label? But it says Vigneron from father to son since 1481. Hmm. There are few legacies like that in in wine <clears throat> or in anything, I guess. Um, and they're all called Jean Louis. No, there was one that wasn't. Oh, and that's that's Gerard who's alive today. <clears throat> He's about 85. <clears throat> that is Jean Louis's father, oh. and he his mother. Uh, Gerard was born in the, in the 40s. So his mother said, you know, I'm sick of this Jean-Louis business. I'm going to name our son Gerard. And so she did. And Jean-Louis, oh, wow. then Gerard named his son Jean-Louis and his daughter Gerardine. <laughs> <laughs> Poor girl. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and now Jean-Louis... The, the current Jean Louis, his son is Jean Louis, and they call him Louis. And he has a daughter Emma, huh. and their mother is American. So it's a, things are changing there, and quickly. <laughs> yeah, quickly, right? <clears throat> so there's the cellar. They have a, a beautiful cellar, <laughs> and they've got a lot of old bottles. <clears throat> And you can sort of see a little bit there. I think there's another slayer there. You look at those. Yeah. There's a lot of mold in the cellar. Sure. Mold is good. Store of time. Look at, uh, I, I was at uh, a house in Burgundy where um, um, the owner of the Maison went down into the cellar and his grandfather put the wines down there that he pulled from 1914, and it looked just like that. He uh, yeah. like, like <clears throat> he had to extract it from the mold. You know, it was like incredible shape. You know, well, Shav, he the <clears throat> Shav from an, he didn't take Hermitage vines until um, the 19th century, early 19th century, I believe. So, you know, the, the label says, you know, from 1481, but that was Saint Joseph. And, and his great, great, great grandfather would, who lived in Mauve, uh, Saint Joseph, would take a boat over to, someone was asking about swimming in the river. I can't imagine the, the current is so fast, but <laughs> he would take a boat over to Hermitage on Monday morning, work the vines and come back Saturday. <laughs> wow. And the, um, but Shav, it's really essential Seth domain, but they're famous for their amortage because that's Grand Cru and that's, those are the greatest ones. Now, Shav has made, whereas his father, each generation needs to add to the legacy, something that they'll be remembered for. And Gerard did an amazing job at building up the domain where since the 1961 vintage, Jabalé would have been considered the great Hermitage. <clears throat> Before that, 
Max Chapuche from the 30s, 40s, and into the 50s. He was a great ambassador for Hermitage. And he made white Hermitage. That's what he was famous for, mm -hmm. the Chantal Ouette. And Hermitage was always more famous for the white than the red. The white, the red is really a later uh, iteration. And in 1961 with the, the Jabalé, that, that, that's when Gerard Jabalé sort of became the spokesman, the ambassador. And I think things turned sort of in the 1990 vintage when Gerard Shav had completed his work. And Shav is, a, I don't think many people that contest his, his preeminence in Hermitage. Do you have the bottle that you're drinking? Yeah. Uh, you? Because there is a, a pretty significant difference in price between the wine. Yes, there the is. Um, I'm, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, Hermitage that you're drinking is, is damn good. It's damn good. And, and I, <laughs> that's what I want to make sure we convey is that, you know, um, Shav has that that Hermitage wine that uh, Mr. Shivrick is 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 uh, showing off, and that's a that's a wine that could sell north of three hundred dollars and up. Absolutely, yes, that's yeah. where it sells. And it's, then the the wine that we're tasting tonight um, on our website is it's like a hundred or something. It's it's actually uh, quite affordable tonight uh, for our, our our viewers at around eighty dollars a bottle. Perfect, great, and, All right. Uh, it is, um, you know, a great rendition, a great, a great Hermitage in its own. And I, I'm, I'm absolutely adoring the way the 17 is showing. And, and it, with your permission, um, Michael Larner, who has the, the wine in his glass, uh, what do you, what do you think of how the wine is showing? Yeah, no, this is, this is stupendous. The, the interesting thing on this wine is, um, and I'm not familiar with, uh, uh, Jean-Louis Chab's program for uh, Elevage, but this one shows much more of that oak uh, integration compared to the other ones. Um, and and for Syrah, uh, Syrah is one of these grapes that can do many different things. It can be unoaked, it can be oaked, it can be whole cluster, no whole cluster. And so it's really pretty to, to, to get that coming through on this wine because it brings mm -hmm. in uh, a structure that we didn't get in the other ones. And so it's, it's so it, it of all of them, this one shows oak, but I love it. So yeah, and, and it's a seventeen as well, and the other ones were nineteen. So yeah. I think that has a big, right. big part of it. And what he, what Shab does is he releases the Farcanet a year later, so that when he released, okay, he's just now I've just picked up the new vintage, so it arrives in a month. Okay. That will be the 2020. And I'm picking up at the same time the 2019 Farcanet. Huh. So he keeps it back in barrel longer and then and then in bottle so that it's more, he, he wants it to be drunk, not to, not to be kept, but really just to be drunk. That's really the idea of the wine. So Michael, you're right about how it's, it's really expressive now. It's really opened up and, and is a beautiful wine. Wow. I, I, I can't thank you enough for joining us and sharing some. Uh, I, I feel like uh, we could have done an entire show just on this one area, this one wine. There's no um, doubt. But and I can go on. You tell me when to shut up. <laughs> well, very fascinating and such an honor to have you and everybody on on the Zoom. It's so cool to be able to do this. And I hope you guys uh, get to geek out a little bit like I am and to be able to share the, the time with um, all of you is super fun and super special. Um, I'd love to now, you know, say thank you for joining us tonight and, and let you know that we're just going to hang out here for a minute and ask some questions and talk. Uh, if anybody has any comments about mm -hmm. this uh, Hermitage or any of the other wines, uh, please uh, speak up. And, but uh, your time is appreciated. We've been on the Zoom for mm -hmm. an hour and 36 and uh, and for those of you that need to move on and uh, tend to the dogs and the children, we understand. But uh, uh, those of you that want to hang out with us, you're welcome to stick around for a few more minutes, and and and, and we can discuss and and get into it. 
Well, it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to to be with you and to I just want to recognize what you're doing is really a cool thing aren't it? because the, the Rhone Valley is not really that well understood and any light that can be shed on it is a wonderful thing and um, so well done. Thank you, Thank you sir. And uh, we we will be taking a little group up there. We're gonna we're gonna do some exploring. We only take ten people, so we don't have to have a big huge bus, and we can get to some of these uh, obscure locations and uh, not have to uh, break down walls to make tur right hand turns. Yep, <clears throat> good for you. <laughs> so if anybody wants to join me, uh, get on the this the list. It's a it's an interest list process. And we'll be sending out the offer here in, in any day uh, for the trip. Um, Matt Kettleman, thank you for joining us as well. And uh, it, again, questions, it's open for you guys to ask questions and to, to bring up the topicality. Hector, you always have something to say. Come on, bring it. Uh, Ian, it might be interesting to have people uh, say what was their favorite. Sure. Yeah, let's let's throw that down on the on the chat. I think that's the easiest way to to watch the responses. Let us know. Let me know. I mean, you know, um, when I put this together, this is a collection of favorites. I was literally able to go out and piece together, you know, my favorite this and my favorite that, and. Uh, um, there are other favorites that I could have involved. We always have six uh, or so in the in the lineup, but uh, this this was really really fun for me to be able to do, and part of the process. I see a couple of responses, but um, throw us down throw down your favorites so we can we can see it, and you can even qualify why it's your favorite. And there's some pretty good price separation in some of these wines. Maybe it's uh, your favorite because it was of its price point. Um, or maybe it's because of the way it's drinking tonight. But I think there's great food application. And quite honestly, these are the type of wines that make a meal and make a memory at a meal when you're with, with people. And there's so many stories behind that wine that the, the one challenge about tonight is uh, like we didn't even get to talk about, you know, how like Hermitage was such a revered wine that even in Bordeaux, they would pour a bottle of Hermitage and Hermitage their Bordeaux wine and make a, a wine that was kind of, because there was a time when probably Hermitage was probably the greatest wine in the world. Yeah, they, they it, it became a past participle and the, the E at the end of Hermitage had an accent aigu, so it's Hermitage. Huh. Hermitage, your wine. <laughs> and uh, that gave birth to kind of the Cab Syrah blends uh, that I think some people are even experiencing right. experiencing with in the new world now. Uh, but uh, even a few years ago, uh, there was a couple of wineries that did a uh, homage to Hermitage, or mm -hmm. is that how mm -hmm. I pronounced it. I think, Ian, the, uh, the saying to Cal U is such a great value. Yeah. And I've I've loved just just like you I've loved that wine for twenty years now, and I've always felt like it, it was just as good as Chardonnay's twice as expensive as it, that that it could stand up to so many Chardonnay's that were twice as expensive, and I just think it's a go-to wine for that kind of a Grenache Syrah um, uh, based wine. Yeah, I, it's such a different gear though that Chateauneuf. Uh is like it's going right from like the uh light heavyweight category to the heavyweight category i mean it's a it's a, a, a bigger bolder wine and there's a just different moments for them but i love the fact that you can open up a bottle of saint nikayu pretty much any night and and not break the bank and and uh it it could be the the ultimate pairing opportunity too and i saw some questions about food and wine pairings and uh, I'd love to get some of the guys' feedback. And Michael, if you have anything, David. But uh, I think uh, there were a lot of comments as I was talking to them about uh, game uh, being very prevalent in the Rhone and a lot of uh, potential for things like veal and duck and lamb. 
and those type of dishes uh, with with these wines. I think all these would be super fun with lamb. Yeah. <clears throat> Ian, I have a question. Can I ask? Please. I, I, the, I'm not sure his name, but the fellow on the right of the screen that looks like he's worker. Um, <laughs> do you have any idea why so many Rhone runners ended up in central north, north central California, Paso? Which 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 person were you talking to? Their names on the screen. Can you see it? No, no, the name's not on the screen. Oh, okay. But uh, it's not you, and it's not the guy in the bottom. With well, Andrew and uh, Michael might have uh, some something. Anybody have? I just I just it just occurred to me that that we're tasting wines that taste a lot like the stuff when we were in Paso a couple of weeks yeah. ago. And I just wondered how many how so many guys up there decided. Because that that isn't exactly the same soil, is it? Not at all. <clears throat> well, how did that happen? Uh, well, if I, I'll jump in real quick. Um, yeah, but, that's you know, there's right. there's. Uh, I mean, the word terroir, right, which is basically going to encompass one of the major components is climate, uh, and and the soils are different uh, from here to the Rhone. We don't have granite. We don't have limestone marls and stuff like that. But what we do have is a, is a similar climate. Um, and, and if you look at solar radiation or units of heat and all these kind of things, that's where there's similarities. Um, so when you're planting a vineyard and when you're looking to make wines that have acidity, balance, and tannin, um, areas like Paso Robles, areas like, you know, parts of Santa Barbara County, those are components that you need to, to look at. And those are grapes that are going to work. And, and you know if you're if you're in Paso, you're going to see a plethora of Grenache, Morvedra, and Syrah as sort of the champions that are emerging from that. And and even some some would say Morvedra and Grenache more so than Syrah, especially on the west side of Paso, um, where I live in, in Ballard, we are very Syrah centric because we have cooler climate um, compared to Paso. Um, so we're making our Syrahs that are almost more similar to like, um, you know, the uh, culture tea, the San Joseph and stuff More like that. Room, yeah. Exactly. So if, if you, if, you know, Ian, if you had that map and you don't have to put it up, but like, you know, it, it, you look at the Rhone, Rhone is almost two sides of a of, of brain where you have this like spinal cord of Syrah and very distinct peppery Syrahs. And then when you come out into that, you know, area with, you know, um, Chateauneuf, uh, Vaquera, and all these things, then you start to bring in Grenache and Morvedra in, in some places even more so than Syrah. So there's more blending or there may be individual varieties, but they're more based on Grenache and Morvedra. And so it's almost like taking that and flipping it. So that's Paso. And we're like that spinal cord uh, of Syrah in Ballard Canyon. No, it's, it's definitely, it's true. The, the Northern Rhone, Southern Rhone are two different climates two different cuisines, completely different. The South is, is, is oil-based cuisine, the North is butter-based cuisine. Uh, the, the Hermitage, the, the Northern Rhone is, is, a, is a continental climate, a lot of rain, it gets snow, uh, and the South is Mediterranean, mm. totally different. But you're right, Michael, they, they all have, the, the, both sides have the Syrah in common. Mm -hmm. and, and just from a historical aspect, uh, I mean, Gary Everly was one of the second people to plant Syrah in California because he took it down from, from Davis and up there and planted it in, in, in uh, Paso, and that became the Estrella clone of Syrah, which is the most widely planted clone across the country at this point. And then you also have the Haas family who partnered with Chateau Bocastel uh, in Paso, um, and Chateau Bocastel is, I believe, from Chattanooga, they're definitely from the Rhone, um, and they uh, decided where to go uh, they scoured the entire state of California to say, where should we set up a Roan house in California? And they decided on the west side of Paso, largely because there are these big calcareous soil deposits. So even though it's warm, um, the soil kind of limits the, the ripeness that the grapes can get. I mean, I would say the Tablas is one of the le the lower ripeness, uh, lower ripe, less ripe styles in Paso, kind of an antidote to a lot of the other stuff that's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, but they have also kind of the Tablas clones of, you know, at this point, 18 different grapes maybe are now uh, spreading all over the state. So they're even like, I was just up in Santa Clara Valley. They're, they're growing Tourette Noir up there, Muscardin, all these like crazy, um, you know, Rhone grapes that are way down the list of what you can put in Chateauneuf. 
Um, but they're starting to pop up around the state and make for some pretty interesting wines. So there's a long history of Rhone uh, in Paso. Um, they still grow more Bordeaux than they do Rhone, uh, but Rhone has gotten a lot of critical attention uh, and, uh, and, and excels, especially on the west side there. Excellent. I, I'm, I'm not the expert that you guys are, but um, Paso has been through some different, you know, uh, generations. I mean, it wasn't that many years ago that Zinfandel seemed like the only thing that they were doing in Paso, mm -hmm. and some better than others, but that's a different critique. Well, uh, Zinfandel producer, I could tell you, they probably figured out that Zinfandel is a little harder to sell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that was part of it, unless you created a, a scarcity like Turley. But in any event, um, yeah, th th but I'm saying I, I, I started going to Paso Robles um, in the 80s care of uh, 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 Camp Roberts. But in any event, the, the uh, uh, yeah, I saw, you know, seen a lot of changes in that regard. For sure. It's grown up in a big way. Um, you know, one of the things that I thought was really interesting tonight was the, the domain de la Genasse is the complexity of the Grenache that you get, you know, and that's something that, that I'm not used to, you know, some, there, some of the people in Paso are doing it, Albans doing it, some, but it's a whole different kind of thing. I just think that the, it's a real revelation to see in the, in the Rhone, in the Southern Rhone, how complex you can get with that grape, because it's it's normally to me, I don't think of it as as a really super deep kind of thing, but you can certainly get there with with the the stuff that we've had tonight. Well, I'm glad uh, you liked it, and it's been an absolute pleasure on my my behalf of my team who supports me, and we work very hard to put these together. We got out over 300 little jars for you guys all to be able to taste and. Uh, um little labels with little fingers and little lids hopefully they all arrived in good shape we do, we have a lot of fun here at blare the music so my team can dance and package all these things up and get them out in pretty uh rapid fashion we did it on monday and tuesday and everyone got them uh well we've made a big uh, i want to applaud ups has really become um our main delivery vehicle and they did a, they've done a great job of getting everybody delivered. So thank you, UPS. And uh, um, I want to thank all of you for doing for joining us because we could, wouldn't produce these events without you guys. And uh, we have some really fun stuff coming. Stars of Baja is next. Um, I, I don't know if you've been to Baja, Mexico, but we're going to show off some really cool uh, wines from Baja. And uh, after that, Stars of Italy and then Stars of Spain. And we're going to take the same approach, very high level approach with Italy and Spain. Um, I think in Baja, we're still learning what is working and, and, and moving around there. Baja is like Napa Valley 1975, but it's it's so good and so much fun. And um, and we're going to have them live on the Zoom with us. And we're going to learn a lot about Baja. And then we're going to taste some beasts from Italy and from Spain. So stay tuned and please come back and tell a friend, get your friends to join us. And uh, thanks for being involved, everybody. Uh, thank, thank you, Ian. Ian. Thank right. you. Thanks, Ian. Appreciate it. You. Scott Bigelow, great to ha see you on the Zoom. Robert, you've been asleep for a while. Hope you're okay. <laughs> Definitely. It's our pleasure every ship. Full of sleep. <laughs> Can we just start singing him happy birthday? Just yeah, that's, that'd be great. <laughs> Uh, good man, good man. He's our law school teacher uh, and uh, grader. Uh, William McNabb, great to meet you uh, tonight. And uh, I know I've poured wine for you over the table. Yeah. But uh, good to see you again. Good to see you. Great job, Ian. Thanks, guys. Come back and see us yeah. again. And All right. Be well. Peace out, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye you. Now.